cordial, uh, a cordial welcome from the International Space Science Institute here in Bern, Switzerland. Um, my name is uh, Michael Rust. I'm the Director of Sciences uh, here at ISI, and I welcome all participants uh, to a new series of uh, the ISI Game Changer Seminars. It's, uh, as of 2020, become a very prominent uh, series of uh, seminars by uh, famous, by renowned speakers and presenters. And I now have the honor to open today the new series called Viewing Earth from Space, the changing environment and climate of our planet. Within this series, we plan to hold about eight or perhaps nine seminars. And I'm very, very happy to introduce Professor Dr. Wolfram Mauser today, who is the first speaker in the series and will open it. Um, Wolfram has worked and still, still does work in the area of hydrology, food security, of course, all with remote sensing. And he's also an Earth system modeler. Um, he's always been interested in observing human impacts on Earth and its environment from space. And of course, also understanding um, the human hyphen environment relations, not only by modeling and simulation, um, but also through direct observation, of course, uh, the limited um, uh, water resources and climate change impacts on it as well, food security, which is one of the uh, subjects of his presentation today. He's famous for a book that he wrote on water resources, efficient, sustainable and equitable use. Um, and he gives insights in that book also into integrative approaches to a sustainable water use um, in the future. Wolfram received his master's uh, in physics and in geography um, and, in PH and his PhD in hydrology from the University of Freiburg in Germany. Um, he was uh, a visiting scientist uh, for a while at the GSFC, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, and the University of Maryland. And he has uh, had many, many research excursions and visits uh, on the different continents of this planet. Until the end of last year, and I have to say, uh, Wolfram and I, we basically retired almost at the same time. He held the chair for geography and remote sensing at Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich. But uh, like me now in ISI, he is restless and still keeps working and he's supporting the satellite-based remote sensing services company Vista in, in Munich in Germany. His talk today will be about future food and water security and the role of remote sensing. We are looking forward uh, to your presentation, Wolfram, and with this, I would like to turn over to you. The floor is yours. Uh, Mike, thank you very much for this very kind introduction. I feel honored. I feel also honored by um, uh, being able to have the opportunity for a presentation as a game changer. I'm, I'm sure we all, the whole audience, are game changers in a way. And um, I think it needs game changes uh, on this planet. Uh, and this is why I want to introduce to you game changes that are connected with remote sensing and remote sensing specifically of, of the Earth and uh, its environment. And um, by starting at Game Changers, I, had, I, I, I was thinking of where do we start with this? And I start with this here. And uh, this, is a, this has been a game changer. This is not a game changer of the future. This has been a game changer. And um, we still think that we cherish the illusion that untouched nature exists. It doesn't exist anymore. And I will give you an example of this. This is a river. This is this river here in Brazil, in Mato Grosso. And um, you can look at this series of uh, satellite images uh, over the past uh, 20, 30, 40 years that we have available now. And uh, this series ends at 2010. And you can see how this has changed over time uh, from a, a largely pristine forest uh, in the beginning to something that is almost completely agriculturally used. And if we, if we uh, have tourism on this river and look to the left and to the right and look at this very pristine forest, um, uh, tropical rainforest that is existing here, it still exists. So we can still have the illusion that nothing has changed 
if we are tourists in this whole area, but of course, everything has changed. And this view from, from remote sensing satellites, that is now uh, a generation old or even older than a generation. So we go now into the, in, into the second generation of these time series uh, of observations of, of, of the earth have given us, have shattered an illusion. And this illusion was shattering of an illusion was a game changer, at least for the tropical rainforests. And for many, many other areas on the globe, it has shown us that we are in the driving seat in changing this planet. And this gives us responsibility, whether we want it or not, um, to, to look at how we do it and to do it uh, in a sustainable way in the future. I want to talk about this here. I want to talk about agriculture. I want to talk about this practice that we have. And this practice is the basis of the food system uh, and the basis of our food security. So food security in a global food system means looking at the food system first. And this is a very short glance at the food system. The food system has its function in, in providing food for consumers or for the population in a social cultural manner. It's different in different parts of the globe, but it always needs land and farmers to produce this food. And it's a process through food industry and it's then delivered to the Consumers, uh, the consumers produce waste and this goes back on the land, ideally, and, uh, and creates uh, some fertilization of the land. So money also flows uh, to the farmers for this. And uh, there is water consumption, both on the land side and on the consumer side uh, for, uh, for enabling this food system. There is energy consumption in, in all three parts of the food system. There is um, energy that is produced on the land, bioenergy, for example, and all this is, uh, this is happening in an environment uh, that is determining how land is used or how land can be loose used for agriculture. But it's not only an, 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 a natural environment, it's an economic environment. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an environment of, of science and technology. It's an environment where satellites play more and more important roles uh, in shaping this environment. And um, also the political and governance issue that has now become very popular. There's much discussion about food security now with the Russian war and the role of Russia and Ukraine in, in delivering food for the, for, the globe, for the globe. So this is, a, this is about civil security and food security and it's about demography. So things are changing in this food system, but the main function of this food system in, which is changing also through climate change is to, to uh, Combine supply that is produced by the farmers and demand, which is food uh, for, uh, for a growing and more prosperous population. So I will concentrate on this part here and specifically on this part here, so I'm now getting smaller and smaller, which is the environment, the land surface and the farmer who is uh, producing food for the food system. So now as an entree, where do we start? Uh, I want to start with the statement that ensuring food supply for a growing and more prosperous population is the largest human activity under the open sky. Normally, human, normally now human activities are industrial activities and they are usually, usually uh, in, uh, done in, in factories. So this is not open sky. So open sky means that it is public, that it is, it is happening under the public eye for the one side. So it can be looked at at, uh, with remote sensing and uh, can be observed with remote sensing. On the other hand, it is, it is using the natural resources of large areas on the globe. This is why it also creates by far the largest destructive human impacts on nature. If we look at deforestation, I already showed you, that's the CO2 emissions that are connected with this deforestation, the loss of biodiversity, eutrophication of lakes. I can, I can uh, continue this. So by far the largest impact, negative impact, of humans uh, through their civilization is uh, done through agriculture. On the other side, we need it. So throughout history, ensuring food supply de uh, depended on a natural resource base. We uh, need land, water, CO2, and fertilizer fertilizers for this. On mechanization, in some way, now it's tractors. In the beginning, it was very, very basic tools. Uh, on irrigation, for uh, which is mechanization, and on the processing and trade, 
in the food industry and in transport. Um, we are now approaching the planetary resources and the planetary resource limits of Earth to provide uh, humankind with food. And this creates a problem. And this is why food supply has to change to stay secured and to stay, and this is even more important, within sustainable planetary boundaries. We don't want to lose our food base uh, in, within the next 100 years because the next generation should also be able to, to use this food, this food base to produce their, the food that they will need. So this means that um, uh, the food system has to become even more global. It is very clear that, uh, that a, a growing part of the global population is now living in areas where they, where they cannot sustain their uh, food supply from the resources, from the local and regional resources. If you look at, at uh, the Maghreb in Northern Africa, if you look at uh, Saudi Arabia, if you look at Egypt, uh, the, these countries don't have enough natural resources for their population. So they are depending on other areas of the globe which provide the food for them. Uh, the use of uh, the natural resource base has to change, uh, obviously, because we are reaching the limits. The use of knowledge and information has to increase. So things have to, have to become more intelligent. Uh, the use has to be more, become more intelligent. And what will, will be the, at the center of my talk today, and this is, I consider is a game changer, is the use of digital twin management approaches. And I will concentrate on explaining and demonstrating how this is connected with remote sensing and how this is connected with uh, Earth uh, system simulations, local, regional, and global Earth system simulations. Now, what is wrong with current agriculture? Uh, this is the basic question because this is, this is a starting point from becoming a game changer and changing the game. With all its efficiency gains, current agriculture is still a tremendous waste of natural resources. More than 90% of today's water consumption is through food and energy production in agriculture. So this is the dominant water cons consumer on the globe. The agricultural water use efficiency is the indicator that links food and energy production with water consumption. We call this the water food energy nexus. Uh, the, the close interconnection between water, food, and energy and the, and the, and the dependencies on the, uh, of these three among each other. Um, so a sustainable use of, is, of essential finite natural resources like water, fertilizer, and others means maximum sustainable efficiency. We have to, be, we have to reach maximum agricultural water use efficiency to become sustainable, as sustainable as we can be with a finite resource. So if we look at this now uh, for the water use efficiency, which is uh, the amount of yield, of agricultural yield, yield that, you, that one can produce with one cubic meter of evapotranspiration of water that is uh, going through the plants and is producing growth of the plants. So you have here the, the agricultural yield. This is empirical data. The agricultural yield in tons per hectare, and here you have the water use efficiency in kilogram yield per cubic meter of uh, evapotranspiration. You see that this is varying around the globe uh, in, uh, greatly. So you have you have a, a, a yield of one ton per hectare for the different wheat, maize, and rice to eight tons and even more per hectare. And if you look at um, the majority of today's global farmers, about 80% of the farmers, they are here. They are poor farmers with yields then around one ton per hectare. And they waste water and land because they do not use soil and drain to the limit of, of uh, production. So this looks like this. This is a lady in uh, Burkina Faso we, uh, who is practicing uh, uh, subsistence agriculture. And you see that, uh, that uh, her efficiency is very low. Uh, she produces about one ton per hectare yield. So in the same region, and also in other regions, rich farmers yield above seven tons per hectare, over-intensified production with large resource inputs and destroy the environment. 
This looks like this here. And uh, with this input, you can, you can reach with the same amount of water, the same amount of rainfall, you could reach seven to eight tons per hectare. So that practically would mean, on the other hand, that if you practice differently from this subsistence farmer, you could also produce eight times as much uh, food from the same area, from the same rainfall, or you could reduce the area for your agriculture by a factor of eight and have the same output. So that would greatly enhance biodiversity globally if we give, would give back, which is a dream today, give back land uh, that we occupy for agriculture now uh, to nature and, uh, and thereby uh, have new chances for biodiversity. So this is the intensity efficiency paradox. So if you extensivate your agriculture, you become less efficient. If you intensify your agriculture, you come, become more efficient. The, uh, the, 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 the basic key is that what you need is sustainable intensification and sustainable intensification, intensification that does not go beyond the limits of uh, what the system can hold in terms of soils, in terms of, in terms of fertilizer inputs, and, and all the other things is the solution for a future sustainable and secured food supply for the global population. Now, how can we uh, reach this? And I introduced this, uh, this, uh, um, this concept of digital twins, uh, digital twin management approach. And uh, the classical digital twin is a controlled industrial process or industrial product, a car, an airplane, a power plant, which is copied into the digital world and represented in an abstract way based on data and process understanding. So you make a copy of a car or you develop a car in the digital world before you develop, before you produce the car. Why is this done? To be able to play around with it without consequences for the real world. So you can visualize the car for, for future consumers. You, you can make representations. You can make validations of your process understanding. Uh, you can do exploration of, of safe operations spaces of these industrial processes or industrial products. You can investigate uh, what if scenarios um, and play around with this uh, product that you are developing. And you can identify management options with least trade-offs. Management options for industrial processes with least trade-offs uh, with most efficiency. So this has uh, in history, and the history of this is, is not very long, uh, this is an in history optimized uh, hugely uh, the efficiency and, and, and led to efficiency gains without bad consequences because the bad consequences are analyzed before they are implemented. So I can remember um, ab about uh, 15 years ago when I first read a paper about a, a, an airplane at Dassault in France, um, which was completely designed uh, in, in, uh, in a computer, in, a, in the digital world, and even, even the service, the way these, uh, these uh, airplanes are serviced in the future has been simulated so that, it's a, so that, that, that the, the, the construction, constructing a company made sure that, that the humans could service it with their hands and arms and, uh, and their limited movability. So all this was very fascinating and, uh, and uh, it was planned and designed as a digital twin in, uh, in a computer and then it was built and, so, and somebody ch uh, climbed in and, and flew. It was not me. Um, so what does this mean for a digital twin for agriculture? So the digital, digital twin management approach in agriculture, the agricultural digital twin is different from that. It, it describes a natural process. This process is dirty. Uh, and not clean, it's heterogeneous, it's unpredictable inputs uh, from climate and soils. Uh, it is complex, it consists of plants, soils, and weather, uh, totally different compartments that, uh, that are coupled together. And it is coupled into a, a digital world and presented in an abstract way based on data and process understanding in the same way as before. And what we want to do with it is the same. 
we want to play around with it. We want to validate it. We want to visualize it. We want to explore. We want to investigate. And we want to identify management options with least trade-offs in terms of sustainability, in terms of yield, in terms of input, in terms of damage of the environment. And this optimization may lead to huge efficiency gains without bad consequences. Efficiency gains for the production and, and without bad consequences for the environment. So this is, this is the plan. This, is, this would be the game changer. And I will show you now in, in, the, in the following how this, how this has already been achieved. Parts have, of it have already been achieved. And um, a, a lot of way is still ahead of us. So why, for the first, do we want to construct a digital twin based on uh, a, a digital twin based future agriculture? First of all, farmers urgently need sustainable solutions for each of their fields. A normal farmer uh, has only 35, around 35 trials during his career. He may take over the farm when he's 25 and he may retire when he's 60. So he, he, has, he has about 35 to 40 seasons. Uh, for a farmer, this is, this is a very difficult situation because gaining experience is, uh, is very limited. So these farmers need support from a much larger experience pool than their own. It's, that's the first thing. We have to expand the experience pool. The second thing is the real world is much too precious for agricultural trial and error solutions. So the farmer does a trial error solution, but uh, it, it may damage the environment. So it is, it is not good fiddling around with the real world if we have a, an opportunity uh, that we can identify sustainable solutions which use natural resources with maximum sustainable efficiency in the digital world. So the questions now are, do we understand natural systems and their complexity well enough to use the digital twins successfully? How to handle their inherent heterogeneity? How to validate them? How to treat uncertainty? And how to identify meaningful scenarios? So these are all pretty deep questions for a very clear need for solutions that we have. Uh, to, to uh, be able to secure food supply in the future. So the bottom line is that data and simulations merge in this digital twin of agriculture. And this merger of digital twin of agriculture, uh, uh, this is what I want to show you now. So how can we envision a digital twin of agriculture? We can start with a, a remote sensing uh, example of this, and I will show you this for this. Uh, the creation, we need, first of all, remote sensing data, and we need radiative transfer models that create the information from remote sensing data that we need to check models. So what we could do is we could, we could create a digital replica of satellite images. And I show you an example here. On the left side, you see a simulated image where you have a crop model, which, which uh, incorporates everything from atmosphere, meteorology, crop physiology, hydrology, human impacts, sensor specifications, topography, and soil. So here, everything for each pixel here, uh, the processes that lead to a growing plant are simulated, and here they are measured. And this is done for the same date for the same dates. So it starts in March, April, May, June, July, and it ends uh, with harvest. So you see that these two are not identical. The simulated one, which does not use remote sensing data at all, but makes a replica of this observed, um, observed uh, time series as a product of a simulation. And now we can ask, this replica is, is, is a digital twin uh, of, of this year. And now we can ask, what is the difference between the two? And this difference between the two gives us a very 
strong indication of where we are not currently not really understanding uh, the processes and where there are some understanding gaps in the process description of the models. On the other hand, there are things we cannot know at all because we don't know, the model doesn't know, and, this, and, and, and the observation doesn't know what a farmer is doing, how much fertilizer is he using, and this and this and all that, uh, we don't know. So this, it, this influences our simulated image, and we have to find out how we can match this simulated image as closely as possible with the measured image. So this is what I mean. Uh, there is a uh, there is a simulation model which which knows about the processes that are producing this landscape, this agricultural landscape. But on the other hand, there is an, uh, an, a sensor system that that observes this landscape, and we can mimic the sensor system um, and and see how this digital twin is is uh, is performing. And this is this is the the very important point of validation of validation of the, of the processes in the digital twin bit because finally at the end of the day we expect that these two images are identical we will never reach that but we expect that this is this should be at some point in infinity should be the case so how is this now done we see here a, a spectrum that is changing with time with bbch with a phenological stage uh, and this spectrum is simulated. This is simulated by a radiative transfer for a model of the soil leaf canopy complex. This is what we see from the satellites. And, uh, and so the solar radiation enters this canopy uh, and, the and the land surface, and there is an exchange. Uh, there is also diffuse radiation, it's direct and diffuse radiation. There is reflection, uh, diffuse, and there is also reflection of di of of reflected uh, uh, direct and diffuse uh, radiation that enters uh, this canopy towards a sensor. So we have a four stream canopy reflectance model, and this needs a lot of inputs. And these inputs are structural, are spectral, are observational. So this is the whole geometry, where is the sensor, where is the sun and all this. And they are describing the leaf, the chlorophyll content, the water content of the leaves, the leaf dry matter and the leaf mesophyll structure and, and uh, nitrogen. And now we are building up this canopy from these leaves and their, and their properties. And the result of this is a spectrum, a, re a reflection spectrum um, that is shown here for the respective um, uh, bands of uh, Sentinel-2. Sentinel-2 has, uh, has these, these bands with the dots here. And you can see how this how this is changing with time and with ch changing with uh, different BBCH phenological stages. And you can see how this, is, this spectrum that is produced here contains information on the, on the plant and on the, on the development of the plant. Now, the trick is that this is not really what we want. We have an, we have, we have an observation from space that comes from, uh, from remote sensing data. And we want to trend to be, we want to convert this in, this this observation into plant parameters so that we can we can uh, observe not only observe the development of the reflectance but also observe the plant itself this is done through inversion of slc and with this inversion of slc we can take the spectrum that has been measured by sentinel and produce from this spectrum parameters that we are interested in time series of parameters that we are interested in uh, the leaf area index, the crop leaf area index, chlorophyll content, canopy structure, leaf angle distribution are examples of what we can derive from Sentinel uh, data uh, in time series of two, two, or two, point half, two and a half to, to five days uh, if there are no clouds and, uh, and every two weeks uh, in, on average uh, here um, in Central Europe. So this is what we get now from remote sensing. We get from remote sensing, if we apply these inversions of uh, radiative transfer models, we get parameters that we can use to describe what is going on in the fields. Now, this can be done now, and this is the nice thing about on the whole globe. Uh, we have, uh, in, 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 a, in a research project, we have selected uh, different sites on the globe. This is uh, all 100 by 100 kilometers. Uh, where we use uh, Sentinel-2 images to analyze what is going on in agriculture on these sites. And these sites are very different. This is a typical site in the, in the, in the Midwest of the US. 
where you see the squared uh, fields, where you see some irrigation, a little bit further south, there is even more irrigation. You see a, a field in Burkina Faso. Uh, as I showed you before, this lady with, with a donkey, this is a field that shows structure of, uh, of uh, uh, poor farmers, small fields, uh, and uh, uh, an agriculture that is not connected uh, to markets, uh, but has a very low yield. You see uh, in uh, southern Spain here, the irrigation systems that are driven by water that they don't have. Um, and you see here in, uh, in, uh, in southern China, uh, rice cultivations uh, with uh, water standing on the field. So you have a very large variety of agriculture around the globe and different practices, uh, agricultural practices around the globe. They all have in common that, that plants grow after what the farmers are doing and after what the climate is giving them. So what you can do now is you can analyze for all these 120 um, sites, and this is something like 20,000 centimeter images, which we have analyzed, the course of, of uh, the, uh, uh, the leaf area index for different pixels and different fields. And you can see that there's a large variety. If you look at maize, for example, here, there's a large variety of leaf area courses of, of uh, development of these plants. And this has to do with different farming practices, more or less fertilizer, better or, or, or worse soils and, uh, and all this. this uh, so we, we get for, for maize, for, for spring barley, spring wheat, winter wheat, uh, we get these curves and we can see the variety and we can see the, gen the, the general um, trend, how this, is, how this is developing. The same for an area in Nigeria, in Eastern Nigeria, the same for an area in India for rice. So you can see you have two types of rice that is grown in this, in this area. Uh, one is uh, during the rainy season, one is during the dry season. So this is the first time that we have this information now available through the Sentinel, uh, to, to the operational Sentinel uh, um, satellites. And this inf information uh, allows us uh, to, to start analyzing what is going on with agriculture on the planet. But this can only be really understood if we can give meaning to these curves, meaning to these curves in the sense that we understand what the farmers are doing, uh, how the farmers are, are, are working their fields. And this you can only do with, with a simulations. So you simulate uh, what is uh, the, the, the course of the vegetation development and you confront the simulation for the, for the first with the observation. For this, we have developed over the last 25 years, a very sophisticated uh, crop simulator we call PROMIT, Processes of Mass and Energy Transfer. And um, it simulates crop growth, yield, and all relevant land surface processes under different agricultural man management alternatives. It is a so-called so soil plant atmosphere uh, model, which, uh, which models the soil processes, the plant processes, and the atmospheric processes, and their interactions the interactions with rainfall, with uh, radiation that comes from, from, uh, from the sun, and uh, lets the plants grow and lets uh, the plants produce yield. So POMED is a fully spatial agricultural simulator. It's well accepted in science and tailored to digital twin applications. It's based on first order physical and physiological principles and laws, which is very important because it, only through this, it can be used for predictions and also for scenarios uh, that are beyond what we know now. It's designed to assimilate spatial parameters from remote sensing and it can simulate management scenarios of the farmers. You can fertilize more or less, you can irrigate, you can do what, what the farmers are doing in this model. And it has proven its value from fields to globe and for applications ranging from smart farming to climate change impact analysis. And I will give you some examples now. Um, first example, this is a global simulation of uh, maize. Uh, on top, you see uh, the leaf area index, how it develops, and you can see a wave that starts in the south of the planet in the southern hemisphere and goes uh, through the tropics and then goes to the north. And the same wave comes down again. So in the tropics, you have uh, two possibilities to grow maize uh, and to develop maize. And in the north, you only have one and the south, very south also. At the same time, uh, this can be observed by satellites, but this cannot be observed. 
Um, at the same time, you can, you can simulate the agricultural yield potential of this maize, and you can see how the yield is building up here. Uh, and, and here is the scale. This is goes from zero to 12 tons per hectare. And you can see how this is, is building up over the vegetation phase. And then afterwards, it's, it's, it's harvested. So this has been done for 300,000 statistically representative samples around the globe for studies of, uh, of the potential of the, the, the food produ producing potential of the globe. Uh, now we do it on high performance computing systems with one kilometer resolution for the whole globe and analyze uh, what we find out. And I will show you an example of, of this quite soon. So how good is this uh, model? It has been compared with uh, 15 internationally established crop models. Uh, is one of the, of the uh, ACMIP team. ACMIP is stands uh, for Agricultural Model in the Comparison Experiment uh, Project. And, uh, and uh, here we together compare and analyze different models that are available for doing these kind of, uh, of, of studies. And uh, OMIT was able to simulate from 1982 to 2006 without satellite images, the annual variation of global maize yield with an R square of, uh, of better than uh, 0.8. And you can see here the, the, uh, the, the FAOs that uh, yield statistics of the globe uh, in dotted lines and, uh, and in black lines, the simulation results from COVID. So this, is, this has encouraged us very much um, to use this uh, in different areas, in different climates and in different regions. But to also use it with remote sensing, together with remote sensing, and I, I want to give you the idea of how we do this. Uh, this is Europe, uh, as you see. And this is the leaf area index development as it comes from, from the satellite image. But we don't know uh, how we have to simulate this leaf area development because we don't know what the farmer is doing on the ground. The farmer is uh, using more or less fertilizer um, and uh, but seeding too early or maybe too late. So, so there's a lot of influence and this has to be um, found out. So what we do is we use PROMET and um, uh, simulate a whole ensemble of different options that the farmer can have in, in applying different fertilizer and whatever. And at the same time, we look at this area here and we have observations in, 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 as a time series. And this time series produces a leaf area index curve, which represents the development of the maize in this area uh, and we compare this with the different options uh, that has prom that PROMET has created, and we see that this option has been realized. This is an option of, uh, of very large uh, input in fertilizers, uh, and so the maize produces a lot of LAI, and it, the maize also produces a lot, of, a lot of yield. So we know now what the farmer has been doing by comparing the simulations with the satellite images. So this, this is the second phase of, of a um, digital twin. So the com comparison of simulated vegetation development with spatial observations using the ZL1 and 2 identifies how farmers manage their crops on the ground. We now see how, how they realize the potential, the agricultural potential they have. This is different each year, and this, this can be observed each year with the central satellite. Now, what I promised you, this uh, very high resolution water use efficiency, uh, that we have created monitoring system that we have created from, from Sentinel-2 images at these different sample points that I showed you before, shows you now that the agricultural water use efficiency here as an example of maize for four different years. And you can identify here now hot and cold spots of water use efficiency. So where it's green, basically the water use efficiency is high. You get a lot of of, um, of yield, of harvest from the input of water. And where it's low, you, you get very little input, very little harvest from, from, from the actual input of water. And you see here, cold spots in China, in Eastern China, but also in the US, but also in large parts of Europe uh, and, and uh, very hot spots of very low agricultural water use efficiency specifically in Mexico, but also in Sub-Saharan Africa. So this is now, and if you look at, at uh, India now, you can see that this is changing over time. This is different in different years. 
So you see that uh, if you look at it, uh, you can see from, this, from the inputs from the satellites where we see that how it's going differently over the years, that this is changing in, around the globe in different patterns over the years. So this is a large progress uh, where you get the big picture of where to invest to increase water use efficiency in agriculture. Uh, so that is, that is a, a, a very valuable information that is needed uh, for developing uh, aid organizations. But what if a farmer uh, wants to have support for one of his fields? Then we use the assimilation of remote time series into the crop model. And I show you how this works. So now we have chromate and the meteorology. And uh, in the beginning, we don't know how things are developing. So we have different scenarios that we, that we uh, simulate. And these different scenarios create a different development of uh, leaf area here. And then there comes a satellite image. And the satellite image, um, for this, in this satellite image, we have an actual measurement that we compare. And we can say, for each of these pixels, which is the most similar ensemble member? And this is now used for this first yield forecast. This first yield forecast, which is very, very basic and very, very uh, un, still unreliable. So now we use this information and go on with the next scenarios, the next ensemble and the next ensemble. And you see how this, this pattern here in the fields becomes more and more pronounced where it goes well and where it doesn't go well. Until the end of the vegetation phase, and we have collected from the different satellites uh, the information and have put it into the model and have always selected the best uh, scenario uh, for each point. Then we have this yield forecast uh, that we get. And this is even still much further than the official yield forecast, uh, which is about two months after harvest. So we are now at the harvest point. And we can compare this with uh, what a harvest machine has measured for each point. So a harvester has measured this year. This is yield that has been measured by the harvester. And this is yield that has been forecasted with the satellite combination of the assimilation of remote sensing time series into the crop simulations. So this is, this is now very close to a digital twin that is a, a replica of the whole growing process, uh, which is informed through a time series of remote sensing information. This can be applied now for larger areas. It can be applied for single fields, can be applied for larger areas. And here we have an example of, um, of, uh, of yield forecast for, for large regions. Uh, this is now Germany. We use the meteorology. We use the high resolution satellite data. And we create, we, we consider water stress, phenology, harvest stages, and yield. And we create aggregated um, harvest prediction, yield forecast maps uh, with different regions in Germany having different expectations of yield. And you see here this area, this example that was 2018, I think, this area here in Eastern Germany uh, was predicted very low yields, and this was because of a drought. Um, now, if you could, this, this is, is at a point where it is, uh, it is offered as a service uh, that uh, people who are interested in can, can order. And you can see an example, uh, the yield forecast that is done by Vista, uh, the yield forecast uh, for France, for example, where you see a forecast that is done in April uh, has uh, this forecast in 2018 uh, of 7.5 tons. And, and it progresses and progresses and more and more information goes into this forecast. And you see that the, that the uncertainty becomes smaller and smaller. Uh, and in the end, the uncertainty is, is minimal when harvest, is, uh, harvest time is, is appro approaching. So even from this point on, you can, you can have a pretty good um, estimate of uh, the yield that you can expect uh, when uh, harvest is, uh, is there. Uh, overall, if you compare this uh, epsilon yield prediction by satellites, uh, product uh, with uh, the, the Eurostat, uh, there is a very close correlation over 19 countries in Europe. Um, and uh, the, uh, the advantage of this is that, it's, that this forecast is at a very early stage. 
So you can plan your infrastructure, you can plan your machinery, you can plan your storage systems uh, for what you harvest at a very early time. And it's, it's independent of, uh, of samples on the ground. We use the simulation, we use the satellite images and uh, produce this result. Now we can go even further uh, with this digital twin and the synthesis of observations and simulations. This is what we get from, from, from uh, Sentinel uh, data, this leaf area and, uh, and uh, leaf chlorophyll content, uh, soil organic matter content. Uh, and we can use, use this uh, together with uh, meteorology to produce dynamic simulations of the crop growth uh, together with uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the impact of fertilizer on the growth of the plants. So the output should be a decision support for farmers uh, that is based on satellite images of what we observe, and that is based on different options that the farmers have. Now, if we take this field again, and this field was, yeah, was uh, also part of the, um, of the teaser, and you can see how this field uh, behaves. You can see the first fertilizer application here, you can see the, the nitrogen content in the, in the soil. You can see the nitrogen content in the second uh, soil layer. And you can see how the leaf area is, is developing. And um, all this is now simulated for different options. You have different nitrogen amounts that you play through. A scenario one with very low nitrogen, scenario two with more nitrogen, average nitrogen to very high nitrogen. Um, doses that you apply to the field. And you can see what's happening first to the yield. The yield is here. And the, 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 the nitrogen leakage to the groundwater is here. And this is what you want to avoid because this is, first of all, expensive and, and second of all, damaging environment. So the, uh, be careful. The nitrogen... Um, Leakage is uh, from zero to 60 kilograms uh, per hectare, nitrogen per hectare. So what you see is the yield goes up if you apply more nitrogen up to a certain point, and then it stays stable. And the leakage increases when you apply more nitrogen. First, it increases very little, and then it increases very strong. So which, where is the point, which scenario should the farmer apply uh, to to uh, get this an, an optimum situation in terms of yield on the one side and in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, nitrogen uh, leakage on the other side and to have an optimum protein content, it's this here. This is the optimum scenario. And this optimum scenario it results in a site-specific nitrogen application recommendation for the farmer. So for each pixel, he, he knows how, now how, to, how, to, how much nitrogen to apply to get this kind of scenario implemented this year with low nitrogen leakage, but on the other hand, with high yield. Now, this is the recommendation. This recommendation is then uploaded on the, on the tractor, and the tractor uses advanced fertilization devices to implement this in the real world. Now, we have the link to the reality. We've gone through this digital twin, uh, simulating and playing around with fertilizer applications for each single pixel uh, in, 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 the, in the field. And now we realize it with a tractor that can use this information in digital format uh, to apply it on the fields. Now this merge based observations and simulations reduce the fertilizer load by 25% easily, at the same time entail yields and protect the groundwater from nitrogen leakage. So this is, this is a way to be more sustainable, much more sustainable, much more efficient in terms of fertilizer loads and have the same yield uh, and, and produce a situation in terms of nitrogen that, is, that can be sustainable uh, because it's not leaking to the groundwater. Another example, uh, and this is my last example, is uh, on uh, irrigation where we, where we we uh, did intensive studies to, to decrease the water consumption for irrigation. Now, this is an example in uh, Zambia, uh, a farm in Zambia, which uh, uh, 
uh, grows, uh, uh, grows wheat. And the problem was that, uh, in, in, uh, that they have a reservoir here. You can see this reservoir. And this is where they take the irrigation water out of this reservoir to irrigate the fields. And um, uh, we have now a, a comparison of the filling stage of this reservoir in, in, uh, in 2016, 2017, and it was around uh, 5.5 uh, million cubic meters of water that they could use. Uh, the problem was in 2018, and when they approached us uh, for the third time, uh, that the amount was only 3.6 million cubic meters of water because of a uh, lack of rainfall. So uh, the challenge was is to, is to satisfy the crop water demand during the whole wheat season, and the wheat season is the dry season. There is no rainfall with low water levels in the main dam in 2018. So can we stabilize yields even with this small amount of water? So the, the solution was the simulation of the crop water demand based on the actual development biomass used uh, for weekly site-specific or sectoral irrigation advice. So we actually simulated how much water did, do the plants need. Um, so this, this is the crop water demand in millimeters per day. And this is exactly the water that is given to the plants and not more. Maybe a little bit more to not damage the soil. And um, the result was that we gave to the farmer uh, from Munich uh, to Zambia, uh, in digital format uh, for, for operating their irrigation systems, the amount of water to apply each, with each irrigation is usually, usually every three days or every, no, I think every day. Uh, and, and this is what they implemented. And the result was that we could, we were able to reduce the water consumption by 30% and still had sufficient irrigation water for all pivots despite the low water availability. And even increased yields by 25% with the reduced water uh, for irrigation uh, in comparison with 2017, from where we increased the yield from 7.3 to 9.1 tons per hectare. Uh, at, and they were measured only at two pivots. So this farmer was convinced afterwards uh, because we, we were successful uh, but we were only successful because he was so wasteful before. He, uh, he, he turned out he wasted tremendous amounts of water uh, in, in, on, on, for his irrigation. Uh, first of all, because the water was available. And second of all, because he wanted to be on the safe side. And he, does, he didn't want to approach limits where he didn't know what, uh, what's going to happen. So this digital twin gives us possibilities, as I said before, to explore the safe oper operation spaces um, for agricultural irrigation here as this example, but also for many, many other things where, where farmers don't have the experience and don't want to make the experience that they don't use enough water. So now, what is the future? The future of, of digital twins with remote sensing is hyperspectral imaging. And I'm very proud uh, that I can demonstrate to you today and it was, it was on press yesterday evening, the first image of DLR's hyperspectral imager NMAP. And uh, Mike Rust and me, we have a very long and sometimes painful um, experience together with NMAP, uh, almost 20 years. And we are very happy that this, that this uh, sensor is now flying uh, and producing obviously marvelous images. And these images are different from what we had before because they have, they measure whole spectra. This is, these are spectral measurements, first spectral measurements from this satellite. And these spectral measurements are much more detailed than what we have from these 10 different bands that we, that we have on, uh, on the Sentinels. So uh, what can we do with agriculture? We can improve the digital twins. Um, and we can move from observation to understanding causes. If you look at these, at these uh, fields here, uh, you have areas where it doesn't grow well. This is an area where it doesn't grow well. This is an area where it doesn't grow well. This is an area where it doesn't grow well. Up to now, we don't know why. Uh, with this uh, enhanced information that we have from the spectra, we can, we can decide that this is, this, the cause for this is fire, the cause for this is crop down, and the, the cause for this is plant disease. 
So this is uh, this is uh, this is a breakthrough because we are closer. We are getting much closer to the causes of of what we see, and we can input this into the management options that the farmers have. At the same time, we can have more quantitative description of uh, of uh, of uh, of uh, different parameters that we need, as, uh, from quantitative description to from qualitative description to quantitative assessment. Now, now. I mean there and. You can see here from the spectrum of a, of a plant that this absorption here uh, is becoming much deeper the higher this reflection value is here. So if you look at this absorption feature here, it tells you how much water is contained in the plant. So, so the more LAI you have here, uh, the more water content you have. This is usually connected very tightly with each other. So water is contained in a plant that is healthy, but if this is changing and this stays the same, this gives us a, a huge indication of what happened to the plant. So this here is, is an image of, uh, of, uh, of the crop water demand again. And you see here that the, the different water contents of the plant in, in this uh, pivot. And this, this can improve greatly how we can manage irrigation and safe water and still uh, uh, keep the, the yield levels on a high level. Now I come to my conclusions, and this is my last slide. Uh, a I think, and I'm convinced, uh, a revolution like the Green Revolution, but based on knowledge and information is necessary for sustainable future food supply. Digital twins created from remote sensing, data streams, and process simulations will be indispensable partners for navigating futures, food security futures. Uh, it, will be, it will not be possible to, to reach these levels uh, far away from, from global natural equilibrium that we need to feed the whole population with agricultural project products without playing all this through within digital twins. There are big challenges. But the biggest challenges are beyond technology and digitization from my point of view. And I, have, I want to raise some critical questions also at the end of my talk. And these critical questions are around uh, digitization itself, but also digital twins and our role and relationship with nature. The first question that I have, will the digital twins finally make the decisions? I very much, I'm very much in favor of, of no. Uh, humans should still make the decisions. Uh, digital twins can only give us direction. Will com companies monopolize their digital twins? This is a very critical question that we have to give answers to uh, in, in the sense that, uh, that we, we, we all sit in the same boat uh, in terms of the food security and, uh, and in terms of food supply for, for a future uh, planet. Will 8 billion megacity people lose their ability to distinguish between nature and digital twins of nature? Um, will people in the future who have only, only seen their environment within cities have an understanding of, uh, of our natural resource base that produces their food? I mean, most people in, in our big cities uh, have no clear understanding where the milk come from, comes from and how the milk is produced that is in, in, in their refrigerator. If digital twins of agriculture completely contain nature and man-made systems, can a tree, a lion, a pristine forest survive without being part of the digital world? So is there a space beyond a digital twin that is still existing and how does it exist? And um, we have to think about new ways of, of holding people responsible for, for this uh, and for, for, for the whole development of digitization. So these are the questions that came into my mind with this development that I strong, I'm, I'm strongly in favor of, and I think there is no, no, uh, no real alternative to this uh, because reality is too precious to fiddle around with it uh, on this planet. Um, but these questions are questions that we also have to address. I thank you very much for um, your attention. 
I'm very open for questions and discussion, and I give back to Mike. Thank you very much, Wolfram. Thank you for this really exciting uh, presentation and perspective that you've given us on how by means of a, a digital twin approach by combining observations with, in this case, promet modeling and the maintenance of yield, you're, you're becoming able to protect our groundwater resources, reduce uh, fertilizer, etc. but also by showing a new perspective on how the increasing diagnostic power of hyperspectral sensing by means of contiguous spectra is not only able to show you potential perspectives and effects, but also particularly the causes. So thank you for that. It was a really, really nice um, um, picture. And you're asking, of course, some salient questions which would trigger many philosophical discussions. I have meanwhile received a few interesting questions in the chat and I'll, I'll run those by you because you probably haven't been able to look in there by giving the presentation. The first one comes from William Wall and he's asking, shouldn't the promet simulation also include effects of pests and diseases on the crops? I, the clear answer is yes, we're working on that. It is complex, it's very complex. It's, it, it's uh, because pests and, and diseases are, I mean, the causes for pests and diseases are pretty well known. The, envir the environmental conditions under which pests and diseases come up are pretty well known. And now comes the but. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's a question of, of, of combining observation with, with simulation because we don't know where a pest emerges. Yeah. We cannot predict where a pest emerges. We have to observe it first and then, and then observe it as fast as possible. When it's small, it's the same with uh, humans. Uh, you better treat cancer when it's small and not big. So uh, because we can save tremendous amounts of, uh, of uh, agrochemicals uh, if, we, if, we, if we enter this, this whole thing at a very early stage. That's the one thing. The other thing is, there is a there is a there is a new um, a whole new um, uh, suit of products emerging from um, from from companies that that, that now produce uh, agrochemicals, and this this is a biologicals biologicals that in, in a biological sense uh, enhance uh, the the, uh, the the growth of, of plants. To give you an example. Uh, I just read that that uh, that new bacteria have been produced uh, that can work with maize uh, like uh, like other bacteria do with soybeans. They produce in the ground fertilizer. This is an old old thing: fixation of of, of nitrogen in the ground uh, that produces fertilizer. But if, but now we we are entering a point where a natural system can be can be, can be um, offered uh, with new bacteria, that maize can also do this. Uh, this is changing our application of nitrogen. This has to be entered into the system. This is a new alternative for the farmers. And we need to know, uh, and that would be good from, from remote sensing, how this, is, how, this is, how this is entering observations, how this is, what the consequences is. This is in observations to be able to, to improve this digital twin. So there's a lot of things going on that make uh, agricultural production more fancy uh, and, and where, where we desperately need uh, these new informations that come from the hyperspectral images where we can look with, with more detail into this. But I'm, I'm, that was a bit, a bit of a long answer, but I'm, I, I could have said yes, of course, <laughs> uh, but we're working at it. But perhaps, uh... Well, from many thanks. Uh, that, that that answer also covers part of the next question, and that is: Does prominent account for the effect of uh, fertilizers or such as fertilizers on bees and other insects, and how it impacts the pollination of the plant species and therefore their yields? Um, uh, the fertilizers with the bees uh, and the insects are not that much of a problem. Uh, the, uh, the the pesticides are. Because the pesticides are are not uh, not specific enough to 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 not uh, affect uh, the insects, and uh, and this is why this is why we have to to strongly reduce, if not abandon, uh, pesticides at all. Because because we are depending on the on, on the bees. I, I mean, this is this is clear for everybody. 
we have um, simplified model approaches in Promet uh, that uh, that look look at this at these uh, at these effects. But this starts with uh, with the, the question: When are the bees flying? This is a climate issue, and, and this is affected by climate change. So, so uh, it, how is how is uh, flowering of the plants and uh, and and flying of the bees uh, synchronized? And uh, and and this this is in the model, uh, but also the effect of these fertile of these pesticides we are developing now uh, has to include uh, what what effect on the, on the insects is, of course. Okay. I have uh, a question from our EC executive director from Tilman Spohn, who says, how can an individual farmer use these remote sensing data or observations to optimize his farming? Or is it more of use on larger than individual farm scales? I think you, you went to smaller scales after he's posed that question, but perhaps a short answer to Tilman's question. Yes, uh, short answer, it is, uh, it is all a question Finally, it's all a question of, 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 uh, of price and capability. Digital services are not prohibitively expensive. Satellite images are for free. So a lot of intellectual capacity goes into it. And intellectual capacity is not for free uh, because humans cost something. Uh, so uh, so this, is, this is a question of, can we, can we reach a cost structure for an individual farmer, a small farmer, uh, to use this data? It has been shown. In Africa, for example, where, where the farmers use their cell phones and they have cell phones uh, on their tractors and the cell phones tell them to, to move faster and slower. And in, in the back, they always release the same amount of nitrogen per, per time interval. So if they go faster and slower, they can, they can have more and less or less nitrogen applied to their field. This has already been shown and this is, this is not, not, uh, not prohibitively expensive, but you have to have a tractor. So for this lady here, uh, there is probably not a big chance that they can use all this information, but for her, it would be most important. So we have to bridge this gap uh, and to make this available to all farmers. And, and, and this, is, this is a big challenge. Uh, one question comes from our uh, member of the science committee, Karina von Schuckmann. How can the user identify the limitations slash uncertainties for the obtained information? Uh, this is this is a this is a critical issue. You can you can uh, use and, and this we we I think this was very successful as I showed. Um, you can compare a satellite image that you don't use for aggregate for for for, for assimilation, of course. You can compare a satellite image with uh, with a simulation, with a simulated image, and, and see the difference, and see where they where they bo both uh, go like this, and then you know that something is wrong. Uh, you have data from uh, farming machines uh, that I showed you, where you can where you can have a a, a distributed information on the yield uh, at the end of the at the, at the end of the, the growing season, and you can see whether this yield is, is right or not. And I've shown you examples where, where the, these yields are compared, the, the simulated yield and the, and the measured yields. So you have a few, a few informations, but on the other hand, it is very difficult, if not impossible, to really validate uh, the nitrogen leakage into the groundwater. There is absolutely no way of, of doing this because by that you, you, you would have had to take all, all the soil away. I mean, there are no, no sensors for that. So what, what is done is to, 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 uh, to, to validate or verify this uh, using, using mass balances. Uh, nitrogen has to go somewhere. So, so we still believe in mass balance. And, uh, and, and it, there is a lot, of, a lot of physical science behind it, a lot of uh, physiological science behind it. And uh, finally, there's a, there's a big discussion now in, 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 in our field, whether we can trust these systems enough uh, to use them even without direct validation and only have a mass balance validation. Well, we know that this much nitrogen had to disappear in the ground because, because we have the, the other parts of the balance are pretty, pretty, pretty well validated. So this is, a, this is a critical point and there's a lot, a lot of science that has to be done still. But we are for the first time at a point where we have a spatially distributed information through the, uh, through the remote sensing systems, a spatially distributed information that we can use for validation. 
And this is this is a breakthrough because before it was always single points, single samples, single here, single here. Uh, and to, to resolve this challenge of, uh, of simulating a whole image with all its heterogeneity and complexity and giving signals where it doesn't work is a large progress. Thank you. There, there is one question um, again by Tillman on the one but last bullet of the slide that's still visible, and he's inquiring about its meaning and if it means that trees, lions, etc., can only persist if us humans uh, manage their existence using digital tools? Question mark. Yes, this is what this is what I'm. This is this is what I'm a bit worried about. Yeah, a lion, a, a, a lion that is not known will disappear. A pristine forest that is not, not known to us and not observed all the time will disappear. So it has to be part of the digital world, uh, it seems. And what does that do to all these natural things? Uh, uh, to, to be part of a, uh, of a global replica, finally, does it give them more freedom to survive and more power to survive if everybody knows? or or? It's not clear to me. The only thing that seems to be clear to me, this is why this, there's a question mark at the end. Does this really mean that? Or is there a, could there be a, an alternative? I don't know. It is, it is, it is strange. It is a, a strange and frightening, maybe frightening thought. But I think we have to think about it. Uh, how much nature, nature is left? And and why, why would it possibly be a good idea to include everything into this digital twin, just to preserve it? Because otherwise it will be gone. Um, I have a final comment, which goes exactly on that one, which is by um, Andrew Lazarevich, who is making a suggestion. He says, I might suggest that a good way to gain a wide understanding about digital twins is to find small scale applications like towns, local regions, as this global technique is developed and deployed. As an analogous uh, issue, uh, the step from local weather to global climate could be could be drawn, and um, he feels that uh, local impact could be crucial to the understanding by individuals. And it goes a little bit also in your um, in the direction of the pristine forest and the lions. So as as, as as more as we go local, we might actually be be able to understand. Uh, the digital twins a bit better. I don't know if you want to comment on that suggestion. So yes, I totally agree. I, I, I totally agree on that. And and if you look at that, the whole digital twin thing is not something that agriculture has invented. The, to, okay. the digital twin is a is a huge issue at, at at the EU scale now. ESA is is having a program on this, so there is there is a lot of hype about it. In general, I have the feeling that 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 this development comes from Earth system modelers, and who have very valid questions, but usually these earth system modelers scale is not at the scale of a single farmer. Uh, what I want to point out is that we have, before this whole thing started, uh, we, uh, we saw the, the, the necessity of the single farmers. Uh, as I pointed it out, it, we should not fiddle around with, uh, with the globe uh, in, in, the, in the real world. Uh, and and uh, now, a few years ago, found out that this is this is a digital twin concept. I very much I'm very much in favor of this um, very local digital twins uh, as as a counterpart of these very global digital twins, and uh, and as something that eventually will grow together. You and I, Mike, we will not maybe not see this anymore, but but I think we have to pave the way now. Uh, for these developments, and uh, and uh, and this is why I'm I'm very much in favor of of um, of pointing out that there is another world in these digital twins that is a single field and a single farmer, and not a, a whole global climate. Also. Although I think it is important. Yeah. So that was a good suggestion, and um, in with this, I will, and particularly with the big thank yous and compliments that I got from many of the participants on the call, particularly those whose questions you've just been answering. I got lots of positive comments and thank yous. <coughs> Excuse me. And with that, I, I think, Wolfram, we relieve you in, in um, 
well-deserved uh, evening. Uh, you have been a fantastic opener of this new series. And I thank you very, very much for your presentation. I saw that Tillman was raising his hand. Uh, Tillman, would you like to make a, a statement? No, I was uh, I was trying to give an applause sign and uh, and I, I hit the wrong button. No, I, I, I agree with you. Thank you very, very much for that fascinating talk. Um, it sounds a little bit like Matrix in the end. I hope we're not all disappearing into a big computer. I, 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 I agree. It has it has two sides. It has two sides. It has two sides, and I think we. It, uh, this is why I wanted to to raise this in my last slide because it's. Yeah. I, I feel it's important. Yeah, I agree with you. Thank, thank you, you very. Much. Thank you very much, Tillman. Thank you very much, Mike, uh, for the invitation. Thank you very much to be to be part of this uh, game changer, to be a game changer here. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I wish you great success for this, uh, for this whole format. I think it is, uh, it is very, very good. Thanks to all, to, to, to all participants in the audience, which I was not, not able to see. Uh, and if there are any questions, please uh, approach me. Yeah, the, um, the seminar for those who would like to revive it, revisit it, will be online in a few days on our EC website under the Game Change the Seminar uh, button. You'll find it and you can uh, revisit it again. It's been recorded. Uh, I would like in closing to point out that in a week from now, again, Thursday at 1700, we will have the second Game Changer Seminar in our climate series given by Annette uh, Barch of uh, BGEOS. And her title is Changing Northern Lands, uh, Thawing Grounds and Expanding Use. We are looking forward to that. And again, I'd like to thank everybody on the call and again, particularly you for an excellent presentation. And I wish you all a nice evening. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you.